In 1846, the Smithsonian holds some 137 million objects in its collections. As the newest member of our family of artifacts, Buzz Lightyear will occupy a place of distinction in our space history collection and will be at home here in this gallery moving beyond Earth. With its live and recorded program, this is one of the, most, uh, the museum's most interactive exhibitions. We feel that Buzz Lightyear will feel especially comfortable here and with, near the video display that represents his space travels. Most importantly, we feel that the Buzz Lightyear popularity with young people will make this display an important addition to our educational mission and a valuable asset in achieving STEM educational goals. STEM is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. The donation we are acknowledging today is made up of three parts from three contributors. To tell us more about Buzz Lightyear's journey to the Smithsonian, I'd like to introduce the curator of the collections of space memorabilia and space science fiction in the Division of Space History, Dr. Margaret Weidekamp. Margaret? Thank you, sir. As General Daly has said, today's donation resulted from a collaboration between Disney Pixar and NASA. And as the curator for the museum's social and cultural artifacts, I have the unique job of getting to take toys seriously. So I was delighted when Disney Pixar approached the museum about donating the Buzz Lightyear figure that had flown to the International Space Station for 15 months. Buzz Lightyear joined the pantheon of famous space characters when Toy Story burst onto the scene in 1995 as the first feature-length animated movie ever made. But Toy Story did more than just innovate with new animation technology. Its characters were so well-developed, sympathetic, and real that Toy Story earned an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay, a recognition of its excellent storytelling. And in addition, John Lasseter, who is here with us today, received a Special Achievement Oscar that year for his leadership of the Toy Story team. Sending Buzz Lightyear into space combined the widespread appeal of John Lasseter's beloved animated character with the educational inspiration of NASA. NASA launched the very first Toys in Space program aboard the space shuttle mission STS-51D in April of 1985 and a second group of toys flew in 1993. These efforts inc uh, included really simple toys, such as a yo-yo or a ball, that could be used to illustrate science lessons while on orbit. For the digital age, NASA and Disney Pixar used the flight of Buzz Lightyear not only for on-orbit demonstrations, but also to create online educational games and related worksheets using Buzz Lightyear to get students excited about learning. But I thought rather than just tell you about this project, I wanted to give you a brief look at it. So in this example, which we'll show you on the screens, NASA astronauts Greg Chemitoff and Mike Fink conducted a science lesson from space with a little help from Buzz Lightyear. Hello, welcome aboard the International Space Station where we're traveling around our beautiful planet Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. That's 50 times faster than any race car. Today we'd like to talk a little bit about Gravity. Gravity is a force that controls motion throughout the entire universe. It holds us to the ground, that is, whenever we're on the planet. It keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth, and it keeps the Earth in orbit around the sun. So if you drop a ball like this one on the Earth, it's going to fall at 1G. Of course, it doesn't do that here. Yeah, here on the ISS, it, it is actually falling. But as you can see, it doesn't look like it's falling. And the reason is because all of us are falling together, Mike, me, the ball and Buzz Lightyear, we're all falling together. And actually what's happening is we're moving so fast forward that as we fall, we keep missing the ground as the Earth curves away. And that's basically what an orbit is. Welcome to dinner. Does he have batteries? Does he work? Oh, that's pretty good. 
So really what we at the National Air and Space Museum wanted to collect was kind of the two parts that you just saw of this educational initiative. Um, the attempt, the ability to be able to have these kind of on-orbit demonstrations using the Buzz Lightyear, getting kids and uh, families interested in space flight and science and technology, and then also all of the efforts that were done on the ground, the online games, the handouts, the uh, curriculum for teachers. And so that's really what we're collecting in this uh, donation that we're celebrating today. So along with the flown Buzz Lightyear figure, and the, this is in fact the same one that you just saw in the video, this important donation includes the videos and educational materials produced by Disney and Pixar to inspire the next generation to get excited about science, technology, engineering, and math. And as we have John Lasseter here today, a pioneer in digital technologies, it's really especially fitting that these important donations, especially the videos and the online games, are really the first born digital artifacts that we're bringing into the collection of the National Air and Space Museum. The stories that they tell fit especially well in this exhibit, Moving Beyond Earth, where we're telling the story of the space shuttle program, the International Space Station, and future human spaceflight. So, if you come back this summer, you will see that Pixar's Mission Logs videos are going to be helping us to educate children and families about rendezvous, re-entry, and space science. And Buzz Lightyear himself will have a special place in the mock-up of the Space Shuttle's crew cabin that you'll see behind me that we've built in this gallery. Given that Buzz flew into space and back aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery, which is uh, the name that we've given our crew cabin, we hope that he'll feel right at home. So we're delighted to have Buzz Lightyear joining us here at the Smithsonian, and we're delighted to have you here to witness the celebration. Thank you. Well, as you can see, the long relationship between NASA and the Smithsonian, which actually dates back to 1960, when an agreement was executed to make the institution the official repository for America's space artifacts. It's been updated many times over the years, and the most current example is the Space Shuttle Discovery, which will arrive at the museum next month. The addition, in addition to artifacts, NASA and the museum also collaborate on educational programs, books, films, and other activities. NASA has generously provided the research, resources for this exhibition, and in particular, its multimedia capability. So that was a NASA capability that was being displayed there on the screen. That's a joke, folks. It's okay. Go ahead and nail that. The, uh, and, and not surprisingly, NASA also played a very important role in Buzz Lightyear's journey to the Smithsonian. It's my pleasure to introduce the Deputy Administrator for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Ms. Lori Garber. Lori? Thank you very much, Jack. It is a pleasure to be here and to continue to carry out that wonderful partnership that you spoke about between NASA and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I want to thank both you, General Daly, and Pixar founder, John Lasseter, for co-piloting Buzz's journey on his way from the International Space Station to his new home here uh, in the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery. So as NASA explores beyond the planet Earth, uh, into the solar system and into, into, uh, beyond into the distant galaxies. We know we have to do things differently and we need to innovate. We also need to innovate in how we communicate the exciting programs that we are doing to the public and that's what this mission has been all about. I first want to uh, thank Mike Green who came up with this idea many, many years ago. He and Jason Cruzan at NASA uh, who worked with both the bureaucracies of Disney and of NASA to make this happen. Not an easy task. But innovative ways to uh, communicate to students and the public about the value of the International Space Station is what this mission was all about for us. This great little action figure was about the real life saga of space exp exploration. Staying for 14 months on the space station would in fact make Buzz, if he were human, the, uh, giving him the space flight duration record for NASA. He was also, however, part of one of the most successful educational uh, campaigns ever carried out by the government in cooperation with the entertainment industry. His mission gave us the opportunity to not only introduce the space station and through these videos like you've seen today already, 
we were able to work a number of educational programs during that 14 months on orbit, including reaching tens of thousands with the uh, online educational games. Hundreds of thousands of people uh, logged in during the STS-124 mission, especially, where Buzz reported every couple days on what the astronauts were doing in space. As part of his return to Earth, Disney and NASA held a national contest to design the mission patch for Buzz's mission. Uh, here's the patch, and Adam Carr of Tampa, Florida, won the competition with hundreds of um, applicants. We also reached millions of people and continuing to do this now at the Air and Space Museum with the videos that Disney, Pixar, and NASA collaborated on producing their uh, mission short videos and they're part of this display, as I mentioned, and go out with the DVDs as well. So as you can see, this educational partnership is a key part of uh, what we're celebrating today as uh, we bring Buzz back to Earth. So for me personally, um, I'm quite familiar with the characters as a mom of two boys, now uh, 20 and 18 years old. But as you can imagine, when Toy Story came, came out, my oldest was three years old. He'd never been to a full-length movie. I thought he was not old enough to sit still through a movie. My husband disagreed. My husband won. After the movie, where my son sat transfixed in his seat, not flinching, not moving, not asking for popcorn or soda, he said one sentence, and it was one of the best sentences he's ever said in his whole life at three. I want to watch it again. <laughs> he was transfixed. So my kids were Buzz and Woody in Halloween and so forth. And uh, they have personalities similarly different than Buzz and Woody. But ultimately, you really got me with Toy Story 3. I don't know if you planned this, but we had the uh, Toy Story 3 come out when my son was getting ready to go to college. Oh my gosh, how could I make it through that movie with any dry eyes? But it did allow my son to be able to pack for college and throw some things out. I took the mother's plan of the three boxes, and uh, so I really, really appreciate personally Toy Story. I, I know that this mission has captivated many and will continue to do so here at the Air and Space Museum. So as just a, a token of our thanks, NASA has put together a montage to uh, present to John Lasseter. It, ha it includes patches of both shuttle missions, his ascent and his landing. It includes the student design patch as well as photos of the space station both in uh, the shape it was when he arrived and we were building, of course, space station, and then a photo as uh, Buzz left the space station. So these patches flew in space and the plaque reads, in recognition of your personal contributions to the educational flight of Buzz Lightyear to the International Space Station, the extraordinary partnership uh, has reached millions of people worldwide to experience spaceflight remotely and has inspired many to join our next generation of explorers. So if you could just come up. Oh, wow. This Aww. is for you. I don't know where we are. Have a good My buzz. You got it. Thank you, Lori. These NASA plaques are valuable because they've been on orbit, and uh, so they have to be guarded just like any other artifact. The, uh, here at the museum, uh, we have a dual commitment to hear history and science, and it's not often that we have the opportunity to research an artifact by talking directly to its curator. Creator. We talk to curators all the time, but in this case, it's the creator, uh, but today we have that opportunity. It's my great pleasure to introduce the Chief Creative Officer of Pixar and the creator of Buzz Lightyear, Mr. John Lasseter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I'm wearing blue gloves, it's, I don't have a problem, it's just that Buzz Lightyear is normally used to small, sticky hands um, in life, but uh, now that he's been in orbit and he's, uh, he's a, 
He's part of the Smithsonian. They have us wear gloves to, to play with him. So <laughs> that's why I'm wearing the gloves. Today is, without question, one of the greatest days of my life. I was born in 1957, the year that Sputnik went up. And, um, and I grew up, like everyone in America and everyone in the world, just glued to the TV for you know, all the Mercury, to the Gemini, to especially the Apollo uh, moonshots. And I lived in California, so we would get up in the middle of the night to watch these in live TV of the astronauts coming out of, you know, you know, of their trailers and stuff with their the suitcases, and they're in their pressurized suits, walking to the gantry to go and climb into the, the Apollo capsules. And they were my heroes. They were, to me, the greatest. I just couldn't believe how cool these guys were. So years later, when we started coming up with the idea of a story of toys being alive and that a classic toy that's a child's favorite is replaced because of a birthday party by we needed to have the toy that replaces him to be the coolest toy one can imagine. Um, I have five sons, and I just looked at them playing with action figures. Um, and I thought, well, we should make it an action figure. And then we said, well, what kind of action figure should be a superhero, this or that? And I go, and all I did was think back to those, those days when I was a child watching the Apollo astronauts. They said, no, he should be an astronaut. He should be a spaceman. And so we created um, this, this space superhero kind of action figure that is, is pretty cool. And if you look at the design of Buzz Lightyear with a clear helmet and then the sort of the, the, the hood that goes over his head and all like that, and the, basically the color white, um, he is those Apollo astronauts walking out because they had those clear helmets on. And it's the coolest look ever, you know? And so that's why Buzz, Buzz is completely designed and patterned after uh, my love and all of our loves of those incredible Apollo astronauts. So, his, um, and then creating the name, um, we were trying to think of names, um, and we were talking about all sorts of stuff. And then we, I took a step back, and we were in a story meeting, and I took a step back and started thinking about, like, <clears throat> well, what are, what are interesting space terms? And I said, oh, the coolest, it's so cool, is the measurement of distance is, is light year, right? It's, a, it's how, how far light travels in a year. I mean, that's cool. And then we started talking. That's a neat word. And so we started talking about it. And then, then we started, I started thinking about astronauts. And I thought, well, the coolest astronaut name there is is Buzz Aldrin, you know, second man to walk, to walk on the, the, the moon. And, and, then we, and then that's it was pretty quickly. It was like Buzz Lightyear. And then we were like, you know when you hit somebody, you go, done, that's it, that's his name. And so that's kind of the origins of Buzz in every way comes from NASA comes from these incredible um, astronauts and space missions and everybody, and it's just what, how they inspired me and they inspired everybody. So, to come full circle, to have Buzz Lightyear get to go in space on a space station, the, you know, uh, on on the the shuttle, I thought, this I could die and go to heaven. This is fantastic. It's like full circle, and now to have, you know, have have. You watched Buzz all this time, you know, up in space. And I will tell you, I started crying when, when the, the discovery connected to the International Space Station. And there's that kind of tube in which the astronauts kind of go through to go from the shuttle into the space station. And they didn't carry Buzz. They opened his wings, they put his arms out, <laughs> and they just did that, and Buzz Lightyear flew in space himself up that tube and into the International Space Station. I got, I'm, I got chills right now thinking about it. I was watching this and I just kind of started weeping of how cool that was. And, and just seeing 
the, how popular the educational series was. It was. Education is such an important part of it. My mother was an art teacher for 38 years, and education and, and, and inspiring kids is so important. And for us to have an opportunity to do that with Buzz Lightyear in space, to get kids excited about science and space and learning. And, and hopefully there's, there's a future astronaut out there that can land on a passing comet or something, an asteroid, that got into the space station because of this mission, I think it will be spectacular, and I know that will happen. And, I, and so we are so proud. Today is one of the great days of my life because I'm so proud to have Buzz Lightyear be inducted into this, one of the greatest museums in the world. And this place has been such inspiration for me and my five sons. And um, it is my honor to present this Buzz Lightyear to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. General, will you please? I'll be very comfortable. I don't have okay. any gloves on. There's some gloves right there. Sorry. Look at the raiders. They're so happy. We have extra large ones over here, General. As a marine aviator flying off of uh, aircraft carriers, you know, you know how to put gloves on, right? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm I only need one, right? Yeah. Look at that. These are kind of small. Okay. Now, this is usually my joke, because uh, when people come in and they have something that they've created and they're donating to the museum, and they give it to us, uh, they're normally not wearing gloves. And uh, so then, when the ceremony's over, they want to go and pick up what it is that they just gave us, and we said, wait a minute, that's now part of the national collection, and it requires that you wear gloves to do that, to touch it. And that's, that's an important point because for the museum, I talked about the 137 million artifacts that the Smithsonian has, no one touches them except the curators or if under the supervision of the curator. Because our goal, our, 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 actually our task is to protect these for at least 100 years. Actually, the, 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 the mission statement says forever. So Buzz will be in great hands while we're here now gloved. There we and, go. Uh, but thank you very much. We'll come accept it, General. Yeah. There we go. Debbie, you good? It's just that they're now responsible for Buzz. <laughs> their lives were flashing before their eyes there when they we looked like it was going to be on. The, but I'd like to thank the donors uh, for contributing Buzz Lightyear to the Smithsonian, including the Disney cast member who worked on the agreement with NASA, the Disney Pixar for the generous contribution of videos and educational material created for Buzz Lightyear's mission to, in space. But most importantly, thank you again, Mr. Lassiter, for this brilliant creation, Buzz Lightyear. Okay. The, uh, one of the things that, that we were talking about before we came in here is our goal in this museum is to hook people on wanting to know more about math, science, and technology. And one of the things that we've learned is that entertainment, or uh, having an entertainment quotient in that exposure is an important part. In fact, maybe the most important when dealing with a younger audience. So this, the significance of what Buzz is going to do for us in terms of the ability to, to transmit information to young folks and to try to create and, and stimulate and inspire this interest in carrying our country forward as the technology leader of the world the way we've always been, we, we probably can't put a number on it, but I can tell you that it's immense. So I want to thank all of you for being here today. 
Mr. Lassiter has graciously agreed to stay and answer questions. And so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Weidekamp, and she can uh, kind of moderate. And, and John, if you'll take care of the questions, we'll uh, be all set. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. If you'll give us just a minute to reset our stage so that we can move this big podium out of everybody's way, uh, Mr. Lassiter and I will return to the stage in, I think, literally about a minute or two, and um, we'll be waiting for your questions. us for a minute while we uh, got things set up so that we could um, have some questions for Mr. Lassiter and it looks like we are well underway. Oh, so, right sir, would you like to start? That's Hi, my name is Jim. I'm from Bowling, Maryland and my question is, did Buzz Lightyear have to undergo any kind of special preparation before NASA would allow him on the space shuttle and the space station? Um, there was, um, as you know, every ounce is counted on the space station. Buzz went through very um, uh, incredible training to lose some weight. <laughs> uh, there were, yes, there were some internal, internal parts. And we all know Buzz Lightyear won't ever talk around people, you know, when they're around. So his, it, you know, when you press his buttons, they, you don't hear his voice, but you, you're not supposed to anyway, because he's, he's alive when, only when people are around. So, but, but they, they basically, they, they lightened him up for, with the electronics on the inside. And so, and, and I think that's it. His wings still work, you know, as you can see in the, the awesome footage. So, yeah. Awesome. Hi, I'm Luke Reisner from um, for Richmond, Virginia. And my question is, if Buzz, if Buzz was 
actually alive, the three buttons right here, what would they be for? Very good. <laughs> well, those, those buttons are his um, communicators and his, uh, his voice box and stuff. So um, in, when, he's, um, on, uh, when he's actually on location in, in um, the Gamma Quadrant of S Sector 3 and he's out there as a space ranger, those um, work um, different kinds of communication back to Star Command. Okay? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> he was um, uh, he was down at Walt Disney World, Florida, uh, riding rides and having no. He was <laughs> he was in very safe keeping down at Walt Disney World, Florida, through Disney Parks and Resorts, waiting for this day that he could be brought up here and um, and inducted into the uh, Air and Space Museum. So he was down at Walt Disney World. Uh, hi, I'm Noah from Iowa, and my question is, as a young child who is obsessed with the Toy Story movies and is now graduating from high school, what advice would you give so I could get into the movie industry? Um, with uh, computer animation, uh, computer animation is a fantastic um, art form to work in. It's a great career now. There's lots of really great studios producing um, high quality work. And um, it, it's not the software, the tools that make, make the, the animation and the art. It's, those are just the tools, it's what you do with it. So what I recommend is to go to an, a school, if you're interested in animation, interested in some aspect of it, go to a good animation school or an art school and learn the basics. Learn how to draw, learn design, learn story, um, three-act story structure, film grammar. All these fundamental basics are really important regardless of whether you use computers or a pencil and paper. It's, it doesn't matter which tool, it's what you do with the tool is so important. So um, getting into computer animation, I really recommend um, a very good art school, a very good um, computer uh, an animation school, you know, whether they use computers or not because you'll learn the tools as, as you go on. And the computer is our tool, and the computers, as you know, change so much year to year. Um, your, your, your tools throughout your career will change, but it's what you do with them will be based upon these fundamental basics that you'll learn in school. And so often young people want to just blow past that stuff because it's boring, I don't need to know that. But the opposite, you, you really need to know that stuff because the, the sexy, glamorous tools, you know, the programs and the computers and all that stuff, they don't make the movies, they don't make the animation for you. The reason why Toy Story, being the very first computer animated feature film, was so successful had nothing to do with the computers. It had to do with the story and it had to do with the characters we developed and we knew that from the beginning. I was trained by the great Disney animators the ends of their career when I was going through college in the early, my early part of my career at Disney and that's what they always taught me and so now as the, the tools are, are so easy to get on everybody's personal computers and with YouTube you can send your, distribute your movies out to the world, it's about making them entertaining and making them touch the audience and that's what you, you'll need to learn. Good luck. Hi, I'm Paul Moore from Fairfax, Virginia. Hi. Uh, you've been a huge inspiration since 1995, and every photo I see you in, you're in a Hawaiian shirt. Yeah. So, what's the story behind that? Okay. Well, first, I want to say everybody's wondering. Uh, the, the first question on everybody's mind is which shirt I'm wearing today. <laughs> yeah, this is the original Buzz Lightyear Hawaiian shirt, the first one that was made from all of our films. For, this was made around Toy Story 2, so I wore that in honor of Buzz today. Um, uh, I just like, I, I always think of Hawaiian shirts are kind of like a toy that you can wear. I realized I found a career I, where I don't have to grow up and um, I, my office is full of toys and I wear Hawaiian shirts every day. They also, are, they, they camouflage spilling food on your, sh <laughs> your shirt really well. 
a solid shirt, you see it right away, Hawaiian shirt, no one notices. <laughs> um, and then also, um, my wife, Nancy, said, you know, it's not about just wearing a shirt every day. Choose the subject matter of your shirt to match what you're doing in that day. <laughs> so therefore, with hundreds and hundreds of Hawaiian shirts, I have to file my closet under subject matter. <laughs> I have car-related shirts because I made the Cars movies. I have to Pixar shirts. I have Disney shirts. And I have my General Tropical shirts. These are the, these are the ones, by the way, in active rotation. I have a lot in, in deep storage. And I have you know, sports shirts for the teams I like and so on. And so I went today and I found the original Buzz Lightyear shirt to wear today. So, and the, most of the reason is it's fun and they're comfortable. There you go. <laughs> My name is Fred Quinn from uh, Leesburg, Virginia. I'm Fred. also an alumni of New York Institute of Technology it, when Ed wow. was there. No okay? kidding. So the, one of the first animation computers ever being built. Yeah. The question is, there is a lot of computer animation talent on the East Coast. What about uh, the idea of building some kind of a studio annex out here? Well, there is um, one of the best um, uh, computer animation studios in the world is on the East Coast, Blue Sky. Blue Sky is up in New York, and um, they, they have access to a lot of, of that talent. So there is a phenomenal um, animation studio there. And Chris Wedge is one of my dear friends. He's, he he and, um, is one of the directors there and one of the creative directors there. And it, they're doing fantastic work there. So. You'll allow me, but what about the Mid-Atlantic region outside of New York? I mean, this is the founding place of computer animation, thanks to the military. So. All this talk about bringing education and creativity into this area. I have a few contacts with some angel investors. I was just wondering <laughs> if you would lend your name, if we could show you what we can do, if you would lend your name, not a dollar, just your name, saying these people are worth your attention. Well, <laughs> I run three animation studios right now. I'm not sure I can add a fourth, but anyway, <laughs> thank you very much, though. Good luck, though. <laughs> Hello, I'm Michael Egan from Reno, Nevada, and wow, I was wondering good. whether or not you could uh, give me a, no, bad joke, sorry. Um, yeah. So going back to story, which you talked about earlier, whether you're doing normal film or you are doing animation, it's so vital in order to engage the audience and draw them in. I find that it's easy, even if you do know the basics and you have all the reference book, uh, books, such as like Robert McKee's story. Mm -hmm. It's easy to obs over obsess on a story and make something that's overwrought and contrived, or you can convince yourself that a flat, bad story is good enough. What is it about the Pixar process that you and your compatriots back in California do that allows you to consistently create such good stories? Because, as you said, that's it's not the question. tools you use, it's what you communicate right. to the audience. It's a good question. When we're creating a story, one of the most important things is that honest feedback from, your, from our colleagues. We call it the creative brain trust. It's all the directors and in, in the key heads of story, the real great story minds. They don't all, we all don't work on every single movie in a day to day. But what we, we look at the movie every, every three to four months internally, and then we get together for sessions, um, brainstorming and note sessions afterwards, and we're very honest with each other. There's no such thing at Pixar as a, as, um, a, a, a note that you have to do. All the notes are just, a, you know, are something that the directors choose, which, which notes are going to make my movie better, but um, they, they're all ears in, in wanting to, everybody there is wanting to make their movie the best it could be. So what I would recommend is that as you're developing, you know, anybody working by themselves creating something, you get very, very close to it. You start focusing, you know, on the leaves of a tree and you need someone that you trust to take a look, read your story, look at your film, look at your drawing, whatever it is, and give you honest feedback of how it could be better. You know, and you want the people that are not giving you notes to say, to prove to you that they're better than you or they're more important than you. You don't want those people. You want the people who are going to tell you, 
give you honest feedback of what's working and what's not working. And that's what we surround ourselves with, is honest communication like that. And that's what makes it makes a difference. We've, we've taken the Robert McKee class, we've, we've read all these books and all like that. You, you, those are the tools that you learn. Now applying the tools is you want to put your own creativity into it. And then you also want that honest feedback. And that's the thing. And you, you know, the last thing in the world that we worry about, or the, at Pixar, the thing that we worry about the most is becoming complacent meaning thinking that we know how to do it. Because every movie is difficult to create. Every movie has its problems. Every Pixar film at one time or another was the worst motion picture ever made. But we don't give up on it. We don't give up on ourselves. We trust the process and we trust ourselves as artists. And we keep pushing through. And, and that's why we, we never stop. I always say that Pixar films are never completed, they're just released. Because we're constantly tweaking the story to, to make it great. So find some good colleagues, some good friends that you trust their, their, their input and, and help uh, and have them look at your work and give you honest feedback. I think that's one of the key things. Great, thanks. Hi, I'm William Goldstein and I am one of your biggest fans. <laughs> Great. I was, um, I was looking for you. I didn't know. <laughs> I knew I had one out there. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm such a big fan that when I first saw the movie at 16 months, I watched it every day until I was in second grade. That's great. And um, my question for you is, um, actually I'm here because I'm really nervous. Um, for, um, is the character development for an animated movie the same as a regular film, and how deep do you get? Yes. Um, that's a very good question. Um, uh, let me just take a step back. Um, a live action film um, and an animated film, they very much start the same with, with a story development and you get into a script. Um, live action, they work on the script and they do pre-production and then they go out, they cast it and they go on on location or movie sets and shoot every angle of that script that you can get. And then they take all of that coverage and go into the editing room for post-production. And that's where they really start putting the movie together with all this footage that they shot. In animation, we, it's too expensive to actually produce um, coverage. You might say like an animated scene looking, you know, animating it from all different angles. So we have to kind of figure out what we're doing before we go into production. We kind of edit the movie before we, make the, before we shoot the movie, you might say. And we do that by using storyboard drawings. And we create a version of the movie using the still storyboard drawings. We call it the story reel. And so we go from script to this storyboarding process and making the story reels. And we will work and rework and rework the story. Just like I said with the previous question, every three to four months we'll look at this story reel. We'll get together, talk about it, we'll make story changes. And I, I'm the guy that then green lights uh, each sequence each movie, but then each sequence, individual sequence, to go into production, shot production, where they actually make, make the animation. And I, my rule is it's got to be working great in this story reel, and then it'll be ten times better when it's animated. But there's no amount of great animation will save a bad story. And oftentimes, in the live action method, you know, they don't really know exactly, they, the, the script reads great, in, in, on page, but when you get out there and shoot it, a lot of times certain story points just don't work, and we discover that. But I think that's why Pixar has such a good track record, is that we discover that early, because we're looking at, we're sitting back in a theater and watching a version of the movie that we can create very quickly, but it's a way that we can test out and see if everything's working and what's not working. It never works the first time. Andrew Stanton, who's one of my colleagues at, at Pixar, he said, be wrong as fast as you can. Because any time you go to the next stage, of, from an outline to a treatment, to a treatment, to a script, to a script, to the storyboard, it's not going to work. And we know that. But let's, let's get it up there as fast as we can. One of the traits that happens with young people getting into uh, this is, is that they, they, they keep their work too close to their chest. Like, like let, let me, give me a little more time. I want to make it really perfect before I show it to you. And then when, when they show it to us, we could have told them what, what wasn't working about that, you know, months ago after the first week of, of working on it. And that's why we believe that be wrong as fast as you can. Show rough, 
you know, so like in creating a story, just brain up and write down a, an outline and then show it to people and see what you get. And then, you, you know, it doesn't have to be in the right format to know whether the story is working in there. And so, so this process is, is a constant, I always think of developing a story at Pixar is like walking through a maze. You know, it's like we go down all these wrong paths all the time, but we learn. We learn a lot each time from that. In fact, there's many things that we have created ideas or characters in stories that we've discarded for a particular story. But then as we do more, you know, like sequels to things, those ideas come back. In Toy Story, when we were developing the first movie, we came up with the idea of a squeeze toy um, a penguin that it was kind of asthmatic and pathetic and he lost his squeaker. It didn't make it in the first one, but it made it, it's Wheezy who made it into Toy Story 2. In Toy Story 1, we came up with the idea of the toys. I just wanted to see the toys alive in a like Toys R Us like store because I thought that would be like Manhattan <laughs> to the toys. And, and the, the Barbie aisle that's all pink would be like, you know, Park Avenue or something. And, <laughs> And the clearance aisle is the area of town you just don't want to go at night in, you know, right? And so, so all these ideas, and so that didn't make it into the first Toy Story, but it made it into Toy Story 2 with Al's Toy Barn. And then the, kind of the big one is that, that we had the idea in that, that scene in the first, when we were developing it for Toy Story, to have this guy, a bad guy, that controls the clearance aisle, who was a lots of hugging bear, who had, his voice box was broken and he spoke with a very deep voice and, and they called him Lotso and, it, and that did make it into Toy Story 1 but we, it, he made it into Toy Story 3. He's, the, he's Lotso or Lotso Hug and Bear in the daycare that, that the toys run into and he smells of strawberries but he's this, you know, <laughs> evil overlord of the, of the daycare. So, so it's, it's this constant development, but we believe great ideas will find their way into, into other projects. And the same's going on with all the Cars movies as well. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Sonora and I'm from Arlington. And um, this could actually be a question for both of you, I suppose. But um, you mentioned that one of the benefits of the Toys in Space program is to teach children mm -hmm. and families about science projects. Right. Do you see an added benefit to the astronauts in that they have this toy in space that maybe provides some comfort or maybe <laughs> decreases the stress a little bit, well, you know, you being away from home? Absolutely. Do you see that footage of them sitting around? Mm -hmm. And they're just sitting there goofing off and playing. I mean, I, that's one of the things that I was so proud of. I mean, because the whole idea of Buzz going up into space was for the educational program. And we were so excited about that. But what, what happened was, I think, you know, and we heard from a number of the astronauts that they absolutely loved having Buzz up there because of that. It was just a great object. Normally, they're showing a ball or something like that. But here they had this character that they could show weightlessness. Or I love those images of them trying to just fly him to, right, to the camera lens and stuff like that. We got a huge kick out of that footage also because, I mean, they become boys, right? Everyone's grabbing at him and can I push the button and let me see if I can get it to do this. And one of the things that we try to do here at the museum with the social and cultural collection, uh, which includes toys, but also these other uh, pieces of memorabilia from the space program is think about the fact that for the astronauts, this is their workspace. So the same way that you have pictures or coffee mugs or designs or things in your cubicle or your office that you make your house your own, the astronauts really make that space their own. They bring pendants from a college that they went to, um, you know, gar go Army, beat Navy, or the reverse. Um, and so they really make that a very personal space. And um, when you see it in a planning stage, it's all very clean. Um, and I think also we always like the footage of the astronauts actually when they're working, it's a cluttered space. Space. They have things stuck with Velcro to every surface, um, but they have you know pictures all up. So one of the things I was noticing is in in that footage behind um, the in the mess in the uh, International Space Station, they have pictures of Russian space heroes. So there's a picture up there, very recognizable, of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who is the father of uh, Russian rocketry, and um, that you know shows that cultural influence also. But being able to have a toy up there, I think they really enjoyed, and it's one of the things that we like to try to be able to tell the story of, not just of the science or the operational things, but what does it mean to live and work in space?
My name is Mikael Wellington. Uh, I'm from Lano, Maryland, recent animation mentor graduate. And uh, I think it's safe to say that you've influenced a lot of us here, especially myself. And I was wondering in your perspective or uh, how, what was it like um, in, in terms of the atmosphere of the studio when you found out that Buzz Lightyear, something that you created, uh, was gonna be in doctrine of the National Air and Space Museum? Um, it was, we were so thrilled, you know, because Pixar, um, all the people who created Buzz Lightyear are still working at Pixar. And um, it, it just, when he went up in space, first and foremost, that was just, we couldn't believe it was happening. We were so honored and so excited about that. And, um, and then when we found out that he was, he was being inducted here in this great museum, we were thrilled. And I said, I'm there, I'm clearing my calendar, I can't miss this, this is really special. You know, so we're very, very excited, you know. So I, I, it's, it's an awesome thing. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, I recognize that um, in my career, um, the way I am as a filmmaker, as an animator, as a director, as a leader, is so made so much, um, is, is kind of there because of the mentors I had when I was a young animation student. Um, my teachers were great Disney animators. They, they pulled out of retirement to teach us. When I got to the Disney studio, some of the, the nine old men, the great Disney animators were still working there at the very end of their career. And they just took us young people in and told us stories and worked with us on our animation, all that stuff. And they just reminded us of what's important, you know, and what we're doing. And um, I recognize that, that everything that we can do that we can, in, in, you know, help. And I think the, the Pixar animators that have been involved in the um, Animation Mentor program is just, it's a spectacular program that they've started, kind of a school on, that's online, but a lot of the great animators from uh, different studios come together to help young people all over the world with, with animation. And I think it's some of the best animation education you can get. And uh, if, uh, I don't know if you agree with that, but I think they've done a, a great job. And um, and so it's a chance that we, we like to give. And I think for us, the, the Buzz Lightyear going up in space was an opportunity. I was so excited about physically having a Buzz Lightyear to go up into space and be up there. But I thought the excitement I had of inspiring children all over the world to get excited about science, mathematics, space, you know, all, all of that, I think it would be great. And to use a character we created to do that I was very excited. We were, we were all for it. And, when I, and I think by being here, he'll be an influence, uh, you know, for on, here physically, but also on the website for a long time about keeping uh, kids excited about what's coming up with NASA and all the new stuff and that they could be a part of it. Thanks Great. Thanks. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, we're right. Hi, uh, my name is Yarden. I'm from Kazakhstan. Uh -huh. uh, my question, uh, first of all, I'd like to commend you um, uh, for your work and uh, you and Pixar for all your work in pioneering and uh, maintaining the highest standards and storytelling and just quality in general. Uh, secondly, uh, as an artist working in the field, uh, I can't help but notice that there's a sort of, um, in the society, um, an um, association and there are, say, stigma uh, towards animation as uh, being related to children uh, solely. So, uh, and um, it frustrates me because uh, it, people um, fail to see that there, it can be, it is, and it can be a tool for social change and an art form. And um, um, my question, and that, that attitude also differs from, tremendously from the attitude they have in Europe and Asia towards animation. And the question is, as a pioneer and the main player in American animation, how do you, um, is, are, there, are there any attempts uh, to create, uh, uh, part, on the part of Pixar to create um, animations that are geared uh, for mature audiences with mature themes? Um, well, I, I always like to say that we do. We just happen to make films that are great for adults with mature themes, but also they, um, uh, they work well for children, too. Uh, animation is great. Animation is, in itself, is just a medium. It's the filmmakers making the films that, that, do, that, that really define that. Um, we at Pixar, we make movies, the kind of movies we like to watch. And so like the films I, I like to make that entertain myself, my wife, my, my parents, 
um, they, as well as the children. And I think that that's a, very, that's a real challenge um, to be able to create, um, create animation that really truly entertains audiences of all ages. Um, without alienating one to the other. Most of the time when you think of a family audience or a family movie, it is geared towards children. And as an adult, I have five sons and we would go to the movies all the time and I would be bored out of my skull and watching something going, ugh, you know, and that's what would drove me to make movies that really entertain adults as well. Now, I think that there's room in animation with the right filmmakers to do adult themed um, adult themed films, you know, there's been some fantastic films about, um, you know, some, some issues all around the world and stuff. Animation, what's so great is it's, it, it's a truly international art form. There's animation festivals all over the world. And it doesn't have to be feature films. It's short films that are made that are very powerful and do talk about uh, things that, that, you know, within certain areas that, that, that is about social change. And I think that that is one of the great things about the medium, and I encourage artists to, to look at that. But it's, it really is um, it's, it's up to the filmmaker. It's up to the artist. It's their, it, it's, they're the ones that are creating it. And I think that's what's important. And, and I think people who have that desire to make a film like that, I, I would encourage them to look at animation as a medium that you can do that in. Because then people, you know, it can be very artistic and draws people into your story, you know, and, and, and the message that you're trying to say with, with um, a very appealing visuals because it's animation. So I think it's a great a medium and, and I think great work's been done all around the world. But at Pixar, we love to make adult films where they happen to be great for kids too. Thank you. I think we have time for one more short question. So you, sir, uh, we'll get to the The questions are short. It's the answers yes. that are really long. <laughs> My name is Aaron Carroll. I'm a student at CDIA, Boston University. Right there. Hey, how are you, man? <laughs> Check out our video game party. Okay. <laughs> you know? But I just had one quick question. Since uh, Buzz was a cooler figure than uh, Woody, when is the Buzz like game movie coming out? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I to ask. Now, Woody would take issue with that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Got it. Everybody has their opinion. No, but um, Woody and Buzz are, are so. Um, you know, they are so much a part of, of you know, the, the whole Toy Story thing of being kind of together. Um, and Buzz is, uh, Buzz, you know, has got great opportunities there. I mean, we showed at the beginning of Toy Story 2 how cool he is when he's kind of out in space and stuff. But I think that, that um, you know, Buzz is really cool. But we also think Will Woody is really cool because he's got such a huge heart. And so... Movie too, though, you know? uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the people in charge of Pixar that. I'll give <laughs> thing back that message. Thank you. Is that it? Well, thank you very much. This has been really delightful. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So. <laughs> really exciting. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have John Lasseter here as a technological innovator uh, and a creative force. And we're uh, delighted to invite you to come back over the summer, see Buzz in his uh, new digs in the crew compartment in this gallery, uh, and come and watch some of the he'll Pixar be, videos. He'll, he'll, the, the, his, the exhibit that he'll be in will be opening when? It'll be opening this summer. He'll be, he will in have June -ish his, Yep, time. he has his own locker reserved in our crew compartment. Um, and so, uh, Please come back and see so, us uh, some more. Right now, we're going to close this gallery so that we can reset it for uh, a, not a seated uh, arrangement, but more for uh, being able to see the rest of the gallery. Uh, but we invite you to enjoy the rest of the National Air and Space Museum. And thank you for your time here at the Smithsonian. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thanks.